A newlywed groom went missing from a cruise ship on July 5, 2005, between Greece and Turkey. In the days following his disappearance, despite numerous desperate requests, his family was informed by Royal Caribbean that they had no news regarding his disappearance with a business-as-usual attitude. The evidence that was found definitely points to a homicide or a robbery. Blood and signs of a struggle were evident from his room in the ship. With numerous witnesses and heaps of evidence, this case still remains unsolved. Pretty much every night I go to bed, I see his face. No parent should have to lose their son that way. George Allen Smith IV, 26-year-old from Greenwich, Connecticut, boasted an impressive height of 6 feet 4 inches, complemented by his dark hair and striking blue eyes. In the year 2000, he successfully earned a business degree from Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. He was very handsome, very tall, great, great sense of humor. He was a lot of fun. Post-graduation, George delved into the family business, working for his father, the proprietor of Coscop Liquor. Unfortunately, the business shuttered its doors in 2019. George harbored aspirations of eventually taking the reins of the family enterprise. During his business pursuits, George crossed paths with Jennifer Hagel, an equally attractive 25-year-old elementary school teacher from Cromwell, Connecticut. Adorned with gorgeous blonde locks, the duo exchanged vows on June 25, 2005, sealing their union with a picturesque cliffside ceremony at the Castle Hill Inn, a Victorian mansion nestled in Newport, Rhode Island. It was a fairy tale wedding. Both families eagerly wished the couple a long, prosperous union. But that wouldn't be the case for long. Cruise ships are like a big party at sea. You can go on a cruise for as short as two days or as long as 274 days. In 2021, Royal Caribbean started the longest cruise ever, lasting 274 days and costing $61,000. For that price, you get to sail around the world and visit 65 countries. So the couple decided to go on a cruise for their honeymoon. They chose the 12-day cruise option. This one cost the couple about $10,000. Jennifer and George flew from JFK Airport in New York to Barcelona. After spending a couple of days in Barcelona, they boarded this cruise ship. George and Jennifer embarked on a Mediterranean cruise aboard Royal Caribbean's MS Brilliance of the Seas. The cruise included stops in Greece, Turkey, Italy, and other exciting places. The ship entered service in 2002 and was refitted in 2018. Brilliance of the Sea's most striking feature is the nearly three acres of exterior glass employed in its design, including glass elevators that span 12 decks giving ocean views. From every public space, you are likely to see the seascape wherever you turn your head. Shortly after tying the knot on June 29th, the newlyweds hopped on the cruise liner and settled into stateroom 9062 located on the ship's ninth deck. The brilliance of the seas was scheduled to set sail just before sunset from the French Riviera, making its way to the initial destination, Livorno, Italy. Upon reaching Livorno, the Smiths took a taxi to Florence, accompanied by newfound friends they had met on board, the Askin family from Laguna Hills, California. Dr. Jerry Askin, a podiatrist, was celebrating his 25th wedding anniversary with his wife, Bonnie, and their three children. Their eldest, 20-year-old Josh Askin, was described by Jennifer as a lively California kid, keeping things interesting. Josh and George quickly became friends. During their stay in Florence, Josh had obtained a bottle of absinthe. This drink is highly regulated in the USA, mainly due to a particular compound present inside the drink, thujone. Well, the main danger from absinthe is that it is very highly alcoholic. It's up to 75% alcohol by volume, so that's 150 proof. Since the cruise did not allow bringing drinks aboard, especially ones that are highly regulated, Josh asked George to help him sneak a bottle in. He agreed, and just before boarding the cruise ship again, he tucked the bottle under his shirt and sneaked it inside. The ship departed Florence and headed towards the beautiful island of Mykonos. After admiring its beaches and strolling through its streets, the couple returned to the ship in the evening. After dinner, the details get sparse. Josh Askins made his way to the casino inside the ship. There he met three Russians, 19-year-old Gregory Rosenberg of Boca Raton, Florida, his 18-year-old cousin Zachary, 16-year-old Jeffrey Rosenberg, who was Zach's younger brother, and their friend 20-year-old Rustalev Rusty Kaufman of Brooklyn, New York, while the group was busy playing craps. 
Meanwhile, Jennifer was playing a poker game with Greg Rosenberg. In the later hours of the night, Josh and George met up and went to Josh's cabin, which was also on deck 9, to consume the absinthe they had brought in. Afterwards, they both went back to the casino at around 2.20 a.m. For the time George was in the casino, he had been bragging about how much money he had in his cabin, money he supposedly received in the form of a wedding gift. Walter Zalisco, a police officer on vacation, became buddies with the Smiths. Later, he remembered George saying he had $50,000 in cash with him on the cruise. Other people on the cruise remembered the couple mentioning they had between $14,000 and $50,000 in their cabin. It wasn't certain if the Smiths really had that much money with them. George's family thinks it's unlikely, but the important thing is that others believed they did. Boasting about how much money you have in your room, whether it may be true or false, can be a damn good reason for someone to target you. How the couple dressed and presented themselves also portrayed them as wealthy. Jennifer wore a beautiful diamond ring while George styled a Breitling watch, which can run anywhere from $3,000 to $40,000. In the casino, a supervisor named Lloyd Botham was seen to be getting quite lovely dovey with Jennifer during the cruise. Some passengers mentioned that Jennifer seemed to be flirting with Lloyd. Josh Askins even said he saw Jennifer and Lloyd sitting closely together on a couch. Other witnesses brushed it off, saying that Jennifer was most likely intoxicated and was just leaning on Botha to gain her balance. After the casino closed, the Smiths, Josh Askin, and Lloyd Botha took a glass elevator up to the StarQuest Disco on Deck 13 around 2.30 a.m. While in the elevator, Josh noticed something awkward. Lloyd had his arm around Jennifer. The Russians had also made their way to the disco. Another detail about the Russians was that they had been causing a lot of trouble since they boarded the cruise ship. Before dawn on July 4th, a security guard found them drinking and smoking by the main pool on Deck 11. Gregory was acting arrogant and shouting obscenities. The Russians were also rude to room service operators, making abusive and obnoxious calls from Gregory's cabin, cabin number 3004, leading to a visit from security. Another obscene call from that room occurred around 1 a.m. on July 5th, with one of the men threatening the operator about their language. A security supervisor went to the room to scold them, instructing room service not to answer calls from room 3004. Troy Gonzalez, the cleaner, saw Jennifer stumbling and followed her to the elevator to make sure she reached her cabin floor. But when Jennifer got off the elevator, she went the wrong way, leaned against a door, and passed out. After Jennifer left the disco, George stayed for about 15 minutes. By 3.45 a.m., he was so drunk that Josh Askin and the Russians decided to take him back to his cabin. When they realized Jennifer wasn't there, George told them to look for his wife in the disco on deck 13 and the pool area on deck 11. After a quick 10-minute search, they came back to the Smith cabin 9062 without finding Jennifer by 4 a.m. Next door in room 9064, Cleed Hyman and his wife heard the men go into the Smith's cabin. According to Zachary Rosenberg, the men took off George's shoes and helped him into bed because George was passed out and not moving. About 10 minutes later, Cleet Hyman heard loud yelling from the Smith's room. This was most likely them having a drinking game, Cleet recalled. After some time, he saw three males walking out of the room and down the hallway. Several reports confirmed that it was indeed four men that entered George's room. So what exactly happened to the last one? Did he stay late, sneak out, or perhaps took advantage of a highly intoxicated George? Following their departure, Cleet reportedly heard cupboards being opened and closed. He also heard as if the furniture was being moved. Was it perhaps someone searching for something, like a huge amount of cash, or was it someone struggling for their life? Two cabins down from the Smith's room, Carlos Menchaca, who was in cabin 9066, heard the commotion as well and agreed that it sounded like furniture being tossed. After about two minutes of complete silence, there was a big thud sound, Cleet said. It was so strong that it echoed through Cleet Hyman's room, and it sounded like someone might have fallen out of the balcony. After the thud, nobody heard anyone leaving the Smith's room, but one person said they heard a woman scream right after the noise. Around five minutes later, both Cleet and the lawyers heard two knocks on the Smith's cabin door. It was the ship's security responding to Cleet's earlier call. About 8 a.m., Emily Rausch, a 16-year-old from Chicago, was getting ready in her family's cabin on Deck 7. When she looked out her window, Emily saw that what seemed like a smear of blood on the lifeboat canopy. She also noticed a mark along the edge of the canopy, as if someone was hurt and landed there before going overboard. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Michael. May I have your attention, please? 
As uh, some of you may notice today, we have been a bit of unusual activity on board the ship. The crew and I have been working with the local authorities and some guests on board to investigate whether a person may have gone overboard last night, or I can say early this morning. We hope to have the issue resolved shortly. It was later discovered that the room had been ransacked. There was blood on the carpet, sheets, bathroom floor, and the railing on the balcony. This was no doubt a crime scene, and two people were unaccounted for, Jennifer Hagel and George Smith. Upon initiating a search in the morning, Jennifer was found at a spa on the ship. She was there for an appointment she had scheduled the day before. Since the ship was somewhere in Turkish waters, the Turkish investigation team was brought in for the forensics. The blood recovered from the carpet, railing, and canopy below room 9062 did indeed belong to George. Something transpired the night before that led George being injured and thrown overboard, forever lost to the sea. First and foremost, the authorities had to investigate who he had been spending time with before the incident. When Turkish authorities boarded the ship to initiate their investigation, they made the bizarre choice to gather all the men together for joint questioning. The Russians explained how George had been drunk out of his mind the night before, and they had helped him back to his cabin, placed him in bed, removed his shoes, and left. This was at roughly 4 a.m., they said. But this case wasn't going to be straightforward. After the incident, it was clearly visible that Jennifer was very cool and calm whenever she was interviewed or appeared in public. This image of detachment was suspicious in and of itself. How could a woman who had just married 11 days ago not even look sad over the death of her husband? At that moment, I just, it's hard to remember, um, you know, my reaction to it at the time, but I just literally remember grabbing both of my arms and just squeezing so tight, thinking, I have got to still be dreaming. This has got to be a nightmare. George's family and wife repeatedly asked the cruise line for information in the days after he went missing. However, Royal Caribbean only said they had no news. The family wasn't told that Turkish authorities were investigating George's disappearance as a crime. They were also unaware of suspicious circumstances surrounding his vanishing. The family didn't know about the neighbors' comments on sounds from the Smith's cabin that morning, or the authorities found blood in George's room and on the metal below his balcony. The lack of crucial details from the cruise line added to the family's distress during this difficult time. Later in the investigation, George's family had been communicating with Jennifer, but they ended contact as she refused to discuss George's death or the night he went missing. Jennifer claimed to have no memory of that night, leading the Smiths to suspect she was withholding information. I just don't get this, I don't remember stuff anymore, because I am convinced in my heart of heart that Jennifer Hagel knows many answers to what happened to my son on that cruise ship. This is, this is awful to my family. Jennifer wants to move on with her life with a large payout, whereas my family want information as to what happened to George. Following the incident, the ship failed to secure itself in Kusadasi, Turkey allowing passengers and crew to disembark, potentially removing crucial evidence. The Turkish authorities investigated for about two hours after the ship's crew had already compromised the crime scene. Turkish police were hurried off the boat, enabling the cruise ship to meet its next port schedule, potentially leaving on board the suspected murderers. On July 29th, the FBI stepped in, announcing their involvement in investigating George Smith's disappearance. Just two days after George went overboard, a sexual assault allegation emerged. An 18-year-old passenger on the ship asserted that she was in the room of the Russian-Americans and was intoxicated. She claimed to have blacked out but remembered between blackouts having non-consensual sex with Greg, Rusty, and Jeffrey, Zach's younger brother. According to reports, they videotaped the incident, with Rusty's lawyer contending that the encounter was consensual. Josh, Zach's brother, was present at the time, but did not engage in sexual activity with the woman. Despite the serious nature of the incident, no one has faced charges in connection with the sexual assault, and the lawyers for the men believe that the existence of the tape played a crucial role in their defense. The FBI had recorded statements from the Russians. The video footage captured in the afternoon of George's passing reveals the three men nefariously making jokes about the incident. The FBI possesses the tape and has only shared brief statements from it, but these statements definitely imply self-incrimination. At one point in the video, one of the men, who wasn't named, clearly states, We gave that guy a paragliding lesson without a parachute. Josh Askin took an FBI-administered polygraph test and failed. When he was questioned about George, he didn't answer. 
instead invoking his Fifth Amendment rights. Askin did, however, pass a polygraph test prior to the FBI administering their version. Invoke my Fifth Amendment right. Were you present when George Smith was killed? I invoke my Fifth Amendment right. Did you play a part in the death of George Smith? I invoke my Fifth Amendment On June 29, 2006, the Smith family initiated a lawsuit asserting that the cruise line intentionally portrayed George A. Smith's incident as an accident, obstructing a thorough investigation into the circumstances of his death. The lawsuit further alleged that the cruise line, instead of promptly reporting the incident to the FBI, chose to inform Turkish authorities, knowing their investigation would be delayed and inadequate. The criticism from the Smiths marked the first public involvement of Hagel Smith's family in the dispute. Bring it on, declared John Hagel, her father. It really hurts us deeply that they're attacking my daughter. As a father, if they're going to attack my daughter, I'm going to fight back. In their lawsuit, members of Smith's family accused the cruise line of engaging in a cover-up that impeded the investigation. The cruise line vehemently denied these allegations, asserting that its employees fully cooperated with the investigation. On June 29, 2006, Royal Caribbean International reached a $1.3 million settlement with George Smith's estate encompassing Jennifer and the Smith family. The settlement, dispersed in May 2008, mandated Royal Caribbean to provide its investigative file on George's disappearance. The file included witness statements to the cruise line and Turkish authorities, along with statements from cruise ship employees. In 2009, Jennifer Smith remarried, currently residing in Connecticut with two children. Despite facing criticism for her actions on the night of George's disappearance, Jennifer maintains it was an accidental outcome of George's intoxication. In 2010, Greg Rosenberg was incarcerated in Florida, serving a three-year sentence for trafficking oxycodone. He admitted to engaging in illegal activities to finance his extravagant lifestyle and personal tastes, driven by a passion for clothes, jewelry, and watches. After his release several years later, Greg was tragically murdered. While he was serving his jail time, he was questioned about George Smith. Did you have anything to do with George's death? No, never did. Never will, never thought about it, no. Okay. Did he did any of your cousins? No. How about Josh? No, I could say no. He went on to say that if he had any information relating to George that would help find the murderer, he would have put it on record. He expressed remorse for what happened to George. He went on to say that he deserved a bit of compensation himself. The investigators had put his family through severe trauma often probing and speculating that Greg might have had a hand in the murder of George. He further explained that he was being defamed on the internet for a crime he didn't even commit, and that brought him and his family a lot of hate and threats. Sadly, this interview would be the last recording of Greg. When he was ultimately released, he was shot down in front of his home. Police speculated that it was most probably a targeted killing incident. Jennifer, along with her attorney, believed certain passengers on board were involved. Having undergone and passed a polygraph test, she is not considered a suspect. Post-settlement, the investigation persisted until 2012, leading the FBI's Mafia Division to explore a theory presented by Dateline, suggesting George's death might have resulted from a botched robbery. In 2015, the FBI officially closed the investigation, citing insufficient evidence to prove murder and suggesting the possibility of an accidental death. The Smiths claimed that Hagel Smith had informed them that the FBI advised her not to speak with agents regarding the case, a statement they later discovered to be untrue. James Walker, Hagel Smith's attorney, emphasized that she has nothing to hide and is regarded by the FBI as a victim with a specialist assigned to work with her. Walker expressed regret over the Smiths' comments, stating, The Smiths unfortunately have lost their focus on the most important issue, that is the criminal investigation into the individuals who are directly responsible for George's death. He clarified that the FBI did advise Hagel Smith not to discuss the case and mentioned that the Smiths initiated a lawsuit shortly after George Smith's disappearance, when his client was emotionally drained. Jennifer will appear at that deposition and raise her right hand and tell the truth, Walker assured. Hagel Smith, in an interview with the Associated Press, refuted the idea that she feared a deposition because she had something to hide, pointing out that she had already undergone extensive questioning by the FBI. If that was the case, then obviously, who would be a better judge than the FBI, remarked Hagel Smith. I was the first person to willingly sit for a polygraph test. 
Smith's disappearance sparked broader interest in passenger rights on cruise ships. In 2013, the Cruise Lines International Association, or CLIA, introduced a Bill of Rights. CLIA CEO and President Christine Duffy stated that this bill codified many long-standing practices of CLIA members and went beyond those to further inform cruise guests of the industry's commitment to their comfort and care. During the same year, Smith's parents supported a bill co-sponsored by the U.S. Senators Richard Blumenthal and Jay Rockefeller called the Cruise Ship Passenger Protection Act. This proposed legislation aimed to enhance transparency in cases of crimes on cruise ships and increase federal government protection of passengers' rights. Some of the rights were as follows. To designate a Director of Victim Support Services. To establish a 24-hour telephone number for crime victims, so they could be in contact with authorities all the time. To develop a written summary of rights for crime victims. To maintain a statistical compilation of reported incidents. And finally, to study the feasibility of having an individual on board each vessel to provide victim support related services. Josh Askin filed a civil suit against the cruise line alleging invasion of privacy, emotional distress, false imprisonment, and breach of contract. The suit sought a minimum of $15,000 in damages. The disappearance of George Smith on his honeymoon cruise remains a mystery, filled with unanswered questions and theories. The case, a stark example of a true crime, highlights unexpected dangers in what should have been a joyful time. Despite thorough investigation, we still don't know what truly happened to George Smith. His loss is not only a tragedy for his family, but a warning about unforeseen risks. This case reminds us to stay vigilant and seek justice. What are your thoughts on this enduring mystery? Be sure to let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more.